to my professor, first professor uh, Dahoud Naibishitu, to take over the session. Bismillah, ya, ya professor. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in I seek the protection of Almighty Allah from the Apostle Shaitan I begin in the name of Allah the most gracious and most merciful Praise be to Allah, Lord and sustainer of the universe May Allah bless his noble messenger Muhammad and his companions and give them peace. My brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters back home. Um, Muslim Puma of Southwest Nigeria and those of other parts of the country. Ebler is presented here by the first speaker, coincidentally. Our brother Sheikh Abrahman Ahmed is going to address us on the subject of the contextual understanding of jihad in Islam with particular reference to the Quranic provisions on warfare. warfare. I recall two very germane incidents, one in 1956 and the other about four years ago. The one that occurred in 1956 was between me and my teacher who was teaching us the history of Islam. He happened to be a non-Muslim, even though the institution was an Islam, a Muslim teacher training college. The subject was Islam and I guessed that he was going to see things that were incorrect about Islam, including jihad. So the little I could do at that time was to go to the library and read up what Muslims had said about, about jihad. And my guess was right. And he said Islam was about a religion that was forced on the people Jihad was forcing people to accept Islam, the Quran on the one hand, and sword on the other hand. And I recall drawing his attention to the fact that um, the Quran had not been compiled at the time. So what was he holding in that one hand? The other one was um, a question put to me by the one interviewing me on BCUS. And one of his questions was, um, what do you have to say about the forcing of Islam on the people of Nigeria, um, especially because the late Ahmed Bello said he was going to dip the Quran into the ocean. And I said, I was a bit of some explanation from him as to what he understood by that, dipping the Quran into the nation. What does that mean? What sense of that does that make? It was a matter of forcing the people to accept the Quran. Quran was already there in the Southwest, wasn't it? 
The point I'm trying to make is that there is a lot of misconception about this, about jihad in particular, about Islam in general. And occasions such as this offer the opportunity for us to re-educate ourselves and educate the general public about what jihad really, really means. And you cannot understand what it means except through the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, which is um, the first commentary on the Quran. And that is why I am particularly, I feel uh, a sense of accomplishment being asked to share this occasion, especially because I know my our speaker very, very well. Alhamdulillah, a gifted speaker, but not a speaker that speaks out of context, speaks within the, the realm of the teachings of Islam. The woman is blessed by, by you know, having a person like him in Nigeria, but here he is in London, bringing the, that message here as well. That's why I would appeal to every one of us to listen very carefully. خَيْرُ الْكَلَامُ قَلَّ وَدَلَّ So said Rasulullah The best of speeches is that which is short but pungent. And I, I can assure you that that's exactly what this speech is going to be. Sheikh Ahmad is going to uh, address us for a period of 30 minutes. I can assure you it is quality 30 minutes. There will be questions and answer and comments thereafter for about 10, 15 minutes. And so we start now. Over to you, Sheikh Abraham Ahmad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله على نبي الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم أجمعين بمنك اللهم وكرمك وجودك يا أكرم الأكرمين ويا أجود الأجودين ويا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد أيها الإخوة الأخوات الأحبة في الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته All praises due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. I thank Him, I glorify His name. I ask His peace and blessings upon our leader and patron Muhammad, the members of his household, his faithful companions, and all those who follow the guidance that He brought until the day of Qiyamah. Uh, one more time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. It's especially challenging when you have a very small student um, having to speak before his teacher and his father. But I ask Allah and Yeshrah li Sadri Wesli Amri Wahmul Abdata Milisani. In point of fact, jihad is not being misunderstood by non-Muslims. I think it is being misunderstood more by the Muslims. This misunderstanding on either side of the divide stems from two points. Ignorance and deliberate mischief. These are the two things 
that Islam as a religion have come to fight. When Allah Taala sent Muhammad with a clear message, one of the principal messages as contained in the Quran is "A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaytan Ar-Rajim." Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَاَعْتَفِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَحْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَى حُفْرَةٍ مِنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا تبارك وتعالى was calling us to brotherhood, to unity, to love, to conviviality. And that we should not be divided. And he reminds us of his blessings and favors upon us. When we were enemies, you were enemies one of the other. It was a state of war and pandemonium. Humanity was on the brink of the precipice to a fall. And the Quran tells us, And Allah saved you from it. Historians have testified to the fact that the 6th century was one of the darkest in the history of humanity. Whether in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, that was the darkest period in the history of mankind. It was so in Europe here, it was so in Asia, it was so in the Middle East, so in Africa, so everywhere. Humanity was at its lowest. Um, it's popular for us to be told that in ancient Egypt, when they accuse someone of uh, uh, witchcraft, the ultimate test is to tie a very heavy object around his chest and uh, throw him into Nile. If he floats, he's truly a witch, and he's going to be stoned to death. If he sings, ah, sorry, so he was not a witch after all, head or tail. It was a loss. This was the condition in which Islam met the world and humanity. War and war, hatred, internecine and fratricidal warfare all around. But Allah reconciled between the, the hearts of the people, especially in Medina, because we are talking of the context of the revelation of the verses of Jihad, collectively called Ayatul Qital. The verses that were revealed, the ayah, the, the, the surah that were revealed in Mecca were distinct. The, the surah that were revealed in Medina were distinct. For 13 years, the theme of the message of revelation was unity. Unity of Allah. Understanding the oneness of Allah, Tawheed, and so on and so forth. It was much later in Medina. Let us look at the context of Medina. When the Prophet got to Medina, I think there were a number of tribes. The Aus and the Khasraj, uh, the two tribes that were Arabs, and there were other tribes that were Jewish. Uh, uh, the Banu Qurayza, the Banu Qaynuka, and another one. About five of them. All the five were engaged in war, in hatred. The Aus especially and the Khasraj were locked in fratricidal hostility. The first message, the first mission of Muhammad was to reconcile them, to bring peace, to put an end to hatred, to war. But let us understand that context it's very important to an understanding of everything. What was the context, for instance, for colonization, for slavery? Well, 
I'm sure today Europeans will explain that while they were not wicked, the world at that point in time allowed, made it impurity. It was not a sin, it was not barbaric, it was not wicked to enslave others. It was not bad to colonize them. Now, to un context is your understanding of the culture, the environment that the other person grew up from. To understand is to know in depth what each party is about, personal interests, attributes, preferences, personality, the better you, your understanding of someone else, the more conducive it is to get something out of them. Contextual means to view information as a whole, both the facts and where they come from. A technique for determining meaning from unfamiliar words or vocabulary is to look at other words in the sentence for clues, commonly referred to as contextual clues. Contextual intelligence, it means the ability to understand the impact of environmental factors on uh, a term and the ability to understand how to influence those same factors. Contextual, when you read something and understand it by how it is written. The person who reads the Bible, for instance, from a contextual approach, interprets it from the dates and the chronological order that the Bible or whatever was revealed. Now, the Quran was revealed some in Mecca, some in Medina. But let us look at three words here. Jihad, Qital, and Irhab. Jihad, Qital, Irhab. Jihad and Qital sometimes are used interchangeably. The foreign word that uh, is being taunted today is Irhab, terrorism. Jihad is not war. It does not mean holy or unholy war. It is struggle. It is strife. And Allah has not used, there is nowhere in the Quran that the word jihad was used for warfare. There is another equivalent that is used for warfare, which is Qital. These must be properly understood. I will come to look at first the word jihad. It's a singular noun. Um, its singular past tense verb is jihad, masculine, jihad, feminine. This, we can look at the Quran and how it has used this word. In about 30 verses of the Quran, you, you find a number, and I just rushed through because of my time. You say, Al-Mujahidun. Allah used Mujahidun. He used Mujahideen. In Quran chapter 4, verse 95, Allah used Al-Mujahidun. Quran for 731, Allah used Al-Mujahideen. Uh, in Quran chapter 61 verse 11, uh, uh, Tujahidun. And in Quran chapter 29 verse 6, many verses of the Quran I have complete list. I don't think I want to bore you with um, here. But the point really that I, I, I want to make is Jihad within the context, the Quranic concept of Jihad refers to exerting efforts in the form of struggle against or resistance to something for the sake of Allah. This effort can be fighting back and aggression, but it can also be resisting evil drives and uh, tendencies in oneself. Donating money to the needy is a form of jihad, as it involves you know, struggling against one's selfishness and inner desire to keep one's money for one's own pleasures. Jihad can be divided into two, into armed struggle, which we cannot deny. It is sometimes necessary. What war is undesirable, 
but in certain contexts, it becomes inevitable. Perhaps it's only one country in the world that has no standing army. All the others have standing armies, they acquire weapons. There is no country in the world today that does not have a, a budget for defense. But let us look at war within Islam and the rules of engagement when it comes to Islam and compare the Islamic rule of engagement in war with others. I want to quickly add here that weapons of mass destruction are essentially haram in Islam because the Prophet has given clear guidance when it is inevitable for you to fight in a war and to enter a city. You will ask me after this, what then is the meaning of war? He said, do not attack non-combatants. Do not attack children. Do not attack women. Do not attack places of worship. Do not destroy the economy of that city by attacking economic trees and centers of commerce. You will ask, what is then the meaning of war? War is to cripple. War is to disable. War is to subdue and subjugate. But here is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi giving clear guidance as to the, how you engage in war. You don't attack children. You don't attack non-combatants. You don't attack aged people. You don't attack women. You do not hit at places of worship. You do not hit at the basis of the economic power of that. So what is war? How many people are there? The only persons you are, you are permitted to engage are those who engage you, are those who are combatants, who hold weapons, who face you. So therefore, Islam will say to drop a bomb on a city is haram. Collateral damage is not recognized in Islam at all. It is within the context of defense and some, sometimes preemption that the verses of Pital are revealed in the Quran. Jihad in Islam does not necessarily involve any violent efforts, let alone war. And such instances of extreme violence, it is, it is a general term that can mean violent as well as peaceful actions depending on the context in which it, it is used. It is a generic word that can be used even when the sought after goals are not Islamic in non-religious contexts. And I want to cite two quick examples. Quran chapter 29 verse 8, Quran chapter 31 verses 14 and 15. Allah has used jihad in these context to mean something that has nothing to do with war. For instance, in Quran chapter 29 verse 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَسَّيْنَ الْإِنْكُ وَسَّيْنَ الْإِنْسَانَ لِوَالِدَيْهِ حُسْنًا وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ لِتُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِعِلْمٌ فَلَا تُتِعْهُمَا And Allah has decreed, it's a decree of Allah that you must be kind to your parents. But if they jahadaka jahadaka if they strive with you ala an tushrika bi ma laysa laka bihi ilm to associate with me that which you do not have knowledge well not to tell you man don't follow them what is the rule the rule here is for sahibu huma fi dunya ma'rufa we're talking of jihad and we are talking of uh, uh, He said, no, when they struggle. In fact, so 
exerting pressure, influence on you to worship other than Allah is a form of jihad on the part of parents that are non-believers. And you're resisting that pressure with humility, with decorum, with kindness, is a form of jihad. It does not in involve violence at all. At all. Nothing. Nothing involves violence in these. Now, aside from the generic use of the term jihad in these two verses, there are other 28 verses in the Quran that talks about jihad in its various forms that I've listed earlier um, when uh, 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 the Quran tells us the characteristics of those who are al-mujahidun. Al-adullukum ala tijaratin tunjikun min adabin alim tu'minuna billahi wa rasuli wa tujahidun fi sabili Allah bi amwalikum wa amfusikum. Shall I not in invite you to again that is sure to give you dividends, to give you profit, to make you rich, to increase your net worth. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inviting you to increase your net worth, not only materially but spiritually. And he says, to me Allah, that you believe in Allah. And that you believe in the Prophet of Allah. And that you do what? You do jihad, fi sabilillah. With what? The amwalikum, with your words, wa amfusikum. And yourself, your life, it does not connote irhab. It does not mean irhab. It does not mean that you should blow yourself up and in the process kill men, women, children who are innocent. Muslims, non-Muslims, destroy the source of livelihood of so many people, cripple so many. This is not Islam. Because Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has made it clear, whoever takes his own life, either by jumping from a height, or by stabbing himself, or whatever. Whatever is the reason, whatever is the means by which one has taken his or her own life, he or she will continue to suffer the pain of that until the day of the Yama. For instance, if someone falls from a height and dies as a result of that in suicide, he will continue or she will continue to fall and die many, many times from that point until the day of the Yama, perpetually. And he blows himself up. He will continue to be blown up from the moment he blows himself or herself up until the day of Qiyamah. Islam does not ad 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 admit of this. Allah. Even in the face of injustice, even in the face of oppression, Islam has definite rules of engagement. Definite rules of engagement that must be followed. In the Quran, you find verses of jihad talking about what some people have called peaceful jihad. What is peaceful jihad? Peaceful jihad relates primarily to self actual spiritual self actualization, defining the enemies, mapping out strategies of war. These enemies are invisible, but they are visible. You may not be able to see them, but they are surmountable. What are these enemies that Islam wants you to fight? Greed.
greed, negative fear, hate, insubordination, vices in general. And you see the Quran has put it in a very beautiful way. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ تَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ Some people call this jihad in nafs. But then, before you take on the world, take on the inner devils within yourself. Fight and subdue them. Now, I really have a long list of verses here that what maybe later I will make it available. But let us look at a few. I am also very conscious. That's why I'm trying to edit as I go along. And you know it's very tough. Now what? You see, we cannot run away from the fact that Islam has basically permitted even the armed struggle kind of jihad in certain contexts, in Greek contexts, in self-defense. And there are so many verses of the Quran saying even the sacredness of the Haram said do not attack people there. But When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about oppression and fitna to ashad you in al do not attack people there. Hatta yuqatilukum fi. Until they attack you there. If they attack you within, then defend yourself. I don't think anybody will quarrel about the fact that Islam has allowed you to defend yourself when you are attacked. But even in defending yourself, Islam has set limits. La ta'tadu. La ta'tadu. Do not transgress limits. And that reminds me of a very beautiful story that I'm told by my, by, by my teacher in one of the uh, uh, verse It was said that uh, Sayyidina Ali, Karam Allah was in, in, in the heat of war. And then they were doing individual combat with one Jew. And of course, Sayyidina Ali was vast in the act of war. And at a point, Sayyidina, the, the Jew knew that Sayyidina Ali was going to get him. And he spat on his face. Spat on his face in order to provoke him. But instead of striking him, Sayyidina Ali held back the sword. And the Jew was wondering, everybody was wondering, you had the best opportunity to get him, to Take him out of the way. He said, no, I'm not going to take him. I'm not going to kill him. He said, why? He said, because I am personally annoyed. I feel personally insulted. If I strike and kill him, I will not kill him because of Allah. I will kill him because he has insulted and punctured my ego. <laughs> so this will give you an understanding of what we're talking about. But unfortunately, the causes of peaceful jihad improving the lives of communities, the less privileged, extending the frontiers of knowledge, improving the quality of yourself, your character, these are always present. The uh, armed struggle jihad are occasional. They are 
brought upon by special circumstances. Because Allah and Islam do not want us to commit suicide, unfortunately. Islam itself is not being consulted for what the jihad, what jihad means. It is some people, Muslims and non-Muslims, who are determining what it means. And final watch, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Why do we have this widespread misunderstanding of jihad? Basically, as Muslims, we have neglected the Quran. We read it. So many of us are profess of the Quran. But we only parrot it without internalizing it. Two, we have deregulated our society such that everyone gives fatwa. Everyone has become mufti. There are internet uh, mufti. Ready fatwa on the internet for people who have not even read, if, if you are from my side, hmm, he has not even heard, uh, uh, heard about the book called Al Mudawanat al Kubra eh, or Jawair al Iqlil. But here is a mufti. He gives you fatwa on the matter of Imam Malik. He has not even uh, uh, read Risala of Abu Zaid al Karawani. And here he gives you a fatwa, fatwa on Facebook. First one on everywhere. <laughs> and of course, since this is a religion of knowledge, a religion of learning, a religion of understanding, we are susceptible to attack from within and from without. Second, and we must acknowledge injustice. Well, I've been told my 10 minutes is uh, injustice is also responsible for some of the violence. I call them violence. I don't call these incidences jihad that we witness. The world would be a better place if it becomes a place that is more just. And the Muslim community will be a better place if it devotes itself to knowledge one more time. Ya Allah, give us peace. Aku lukau lihana, wa astagfirullah al-azimah, liwa lakum, wa sallim, 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 wa sallim,